This is Canada Reads American Style, featuring two friends who love Canada Reads and Canadian literature. Welcome our host Rebecca from Michigan and Tara from Ontario. Hi everyone, it is Rebecca and Tara, and today is book chat number 11. And I'll start by asking Tara, how are things going with you? Hello, Rebecca. Well, we have a very exciting something, something like a bookish event that we can actually discuss today because you and I both, we just saw each other. What is today? Like four or five days ago, right? Yeah. At Eden Mills at the Eden Mills Writers Festival. Yes. And it was fantastic. I am so excited that I got to go to my first one and you went to number 20 something, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so yeah. glad that you had a great day. Yeah. And in fact, I didn't even get to gush about how great I thought it was, but it will come out in a little bit here as we talk about awesome. it. But yeah, I it was really nice because our good friend Colleen invited me to stay with her and she had never been. So she and I drove up to Eden Mills and met up with you and your family. And uh, it was, but I love, I have to say one thing that made me laugh. So yeah. Basically, they have different sessions, and all of us went to the same session the first for the first one, and the other three, I think you all were together, and I was on my own, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> Colleen went to a different one, one, one different oh, one than okay. we did, so she was on her own for one time, and then we met up with her for the final two or something like that. I can't remember, but yes, like of the four, Colleen and I went to three of the same ones. And that yeah. just goes to show I'm a, I'm a bit of an oddball. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I have to say it was just the greatest uh, festival. I've never, I don't think I've ever been to a book festival the way this was. And it was just fabulous. I just right. love listening to authors. It was so much fun. It was a gorgeous setting, beautiful day. It could not have been more perfect. So yeah, it's a magical place. It really is. Now, because we kind of got separated and we would keep running into each other because the village is tiny, mm -hmm. but it was in passing as we were going from one place to the next or something. Uh, we didn't get to tell each other what we bought, like what books we purchased. Yes. I would love to find out what you bought. Okay. I bought, let's see. I bought Try Not to Be Strange, which I'll talk about in a minute by Michael okay. Hingston. I bought Outsider by Brett Popplewell. I also bought, oh shoot, I don't even have them in front of me to tell you the truth, but I think I bought a total of six books, but I also bought a couple of books and some children's books from the vendors that were along the walkway. Mm -hmm. And so I think I bought two books there. One was like a cozy mystery. One was a sci-fi uh, a sci-fi, like political sci-fi kind of thing. Oh yeah. yeah. And then That's I bought, yeah. Deal. And then I bought, yeah. Then I bought some kids books and then I did buy the next day because they had run out of river mama. I bought, mm -hmm. I bought that at Indigo. Nice. What did you buy? I bought, well, I, uh, so the way the Eden Mills, they have their main bookseller is the bookshelf, which is independent bookstore in Guelph. And so, and then they also, along their publisher way, publisher's way, have a whole bunch of small independent presses and publishers and even self-published authors. Mm -hmm. Generally, I end up purchasing the majority of my books at, from the bookshelf. Mm -hmm. But this year, I don't know what happened. I lost track of time and I did not get to the bookshelf table until the, like the last session was over, the oh. end of the day. And they had very few books left. Mm -hmm. I did end up buying The Circle by Katerina Vermette. So I am super excited for that book. And mm -hmm. um, so that's the only one I bought from them. And then I was like, well, I can't come to Eden Mills and just buy one book. Come <laughs> on, that's ridiculous. So, but what I ended up doing, and I really enjoyed it, and I think I'm going to do it like the following years, I went to smaller publishers like you already did but I usually end up spending all my money at the bookshelf mm -hmm. so I went to the table by Gordon Hill Press and I bought a book of poetry from them 
Mm -hmm. And then they also had in addition, so from a, another press, like an independent press where they did local poetry poets. So mm -hmm. I bought two poetry books from that table. And then because I've gotten into reading Christmas books, holiday books, I should say, there was this one table that I kept walking by all day and she had her books out and they were like the prettiest covers. So I ran over to her table. It was just a young woman from here in Ontario and she writes romantic comedies that are, she started a series. Her name is Tori Samuels, and they're a Holly Fate series. So each book takes place at a particular holiday, and they're all in the same, like, world kind of thing of same characters, like circle world of characters. Mm -hmm. So I bought two from her, uh, one for Christmas and another one from New Year's Eve. So that will be my, like, oh. add to my December list. And then she had, on the other side of her table, there were, like, different looking books. So I'm like, well, what's going on here? So she also publishes fantasy books by a different name. So I picked up one of her fantasy books as oh, well. Wow. Yeah. So I really look, I'm really happy with my little pile. Yeah. I, th there was another book I bought, because I actually walked away with quite a few books there. You really. did. But I also bought them because I some of them I looked to see if I had could already because some are already they've been out for a little bit like just this year, mm -hmm. and I could not find them in Michigan. So I knew there were some I was going to have to buy or I wanted to buy so that I could read them right away. The other the last one I did buy was Harvesting Freedom Freedom by Gabrielle Aladwa, and that's the one about the migrant workers in Canada. And I bought that one from him as well, from the bookshelves. I bought I bought that one as well. I wanted to just call out three books and three talks, the three author talks that I specific or especially liked, I should say. Yeah. And the first one I is River Mama, because I have to tell you, the young woman, Zalika Reed Benta, she was just fabulous as a panelist. And I will say too that everybody, all of the authors I saw during the, my four sessions, all of them were amazing. And so this is not to say that I, I could call them all out, but we don't have time for that. So I'm picking my top three basically. But yeah, Zalika, she was funny. She was vibrant. She had so much energy and passion and she was laughing. And it was such a joy. I could have listened to her talk for probably two hours. She was so fun. Wow. And I was already wanting to read her book, but this just solidified it. So I'm really excited uh, to, to read that one. And in fact, you and I are going to do a buddy read for yeah, that, right? We yeah. are. I'm very excited to start this book. Yeah. And then do you want to mention anybody? Because I've got two more, but do you want me to keep going or do you want to no, you mention anybody? Going. Okay. No, keep going. I wanted to specifically hear Brett Popplewell speak, but it turns out the other two guys that were talking uh, were talking about their books. I bought one of them, and the other one I eventually will read as well. But so Brett Popplewell wrote "Outsider," "An Old Man," "A Mountain," and "The Search for a Hidden Past," and it's really about this guy who lives somewhere in BC in an old bus, completely off the grid, no social media, no phone, no nothing. And Brett just talking about how he, when it came time to interview him, he, like he said, he couldn't just text him and say, hey, can I, can you clarify this thing for me? Yeah. He ended up making 12 trips to see him in person. And he said, even wow. then, finding him was sometimes a challenge. So that was absolutely fascinating. Wow. And this and where is he from? The author is he from BC as well, or I don't think so. I'm not. Let me see if it says here. Uh, no, it doesn't say anything. I'm not a hundred percent sure where he's from. But what was interesting? Well, let me mention the other person, and then I'll tell you what was interesting about both of these two authors. But the other book is "Try Not to Be Strange" by Michael Hingston, and I'm going to try to. I'm going to read a little bit of this because this is such a hard book to explain. But when he was talking about it. Uh, I will never be as eloquent, but here's the bottom line. So the book is, as I, as I said, titled, Try Not to Be Strange, The Curious History of the Kingdom of Redonda. And basically it's this uninhabited 
guano encrusted island and it has a fantastical and international kingdom of writers that have claimed to be the king of it at one time or another and they well they'll have like a court they'll they'll like it's become part of who they are as people it's really weird and it goes back way back into like the 1880s all the way to current and when he discovered this so this is nonfiction? Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. No, go. Uh, trust me. Ask a question because it is the most bizarre book. And it's so weird because I did not, for some reason, when I was going over all the titles the, of all the authors at Eden Mills this year, I somehow didn't see this book or didn't strike me or whatever. This guy was so fascinating. And this crazy story of all of these people. I mean, some of them are like, what were they say? Nobel Prize front runners alcoholic poets, sci-fi novelists. These are all these real life people who at one time or another claim to be the king of Redonda. It's very weird. That's so weird. What was interesting though, the, the moderator was a library director. I think he was from Guelph, but he did a great job moderating. But one of the questions he asked was just about the fact that they had inserted themselves, the authors, into their stories. And both of them said that when they were writing their books, the, their editors basically said, you need to put yourself in there. Otherwise, this is a no-go. Like the book is not as interesting unless you insert yourselves and your stories in there. So that's another thing I think will be really fascinating to, is to learn more about these two writers and really see why their stories needed to be a part of these bizarre stories that they wrote, right? Yeah. Fascinating. Absolutely love that session. So I just wanted to call out those three because I had so much fun listening to everybody, but those were the three that I was just had the biggest, goofiest, dumb smile on my face, just pouring over every word they said. I just loved all three of them. So I had, was going to ask you what your highlight was. Can you choose a highlight or is it just all three of those authors? I think the highlight was that session with those two authors of nonfiction and the other one who's written a lot about the North. Mm -hmm. And I cannot think of his book, but he's an older guy. And he was just hilarious because he he just had a lot to say. And plus, as I said, the moderator, it was just funny as hell. It was just yeah. so, and I felt like I was just like, almost at a comedy club. They were just so funny. All three of the men, the writers and the moderator, like I said, I could have sat and listened to those guys talk forever. It was just so much fun. Nice. How about you? Like, what was your highlight? Oh, so I went to the session with Uzma Jalaluddin, Amy Jones, and Ali Hassan. And I, oh my God, Rebecca, it was so good. Because Ali is so charming and so funny. So, so funny. Yeah. And then, but at the same time, the other two and the moderator, I think, was Tara Ross. They couldn't keep up with him, but they did a pretty damn good job. Like, I got to say, they were pretty funny as well. <laughs> but he was just so, like, naturally just, yeah. whap, 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 whap. So it was just really fun watching the three of them interact and go back and forth. And then my other highlight was um, the final session of the day that I went to with Katerina Vermette and Amanda yeah. Peters because they were, yeah, she's, again, she's amazing, uh, Katerina Vermette. She's so comfortable up there and she's got like such a nice wit to her. It was just really fun to watch them as well. So yeah, great day. Yeah. So what, did you, did one of, did any one thing sort of stand out to you as the highlight of the day or? No, you know you what? For me, it was just like a solid day. The whole, like it was just a really solid mm -hmm. festival this year. I always enjoy it. Usually I find I have one session that's like, I think that's why I didn't make it to the bookshelf until the end of the day. Cause I usually, there's one session where I'm kind of like, oh, I could give or take, maybe I'll just go shop for books right now. But that didn't happen. Like it was just. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it the whole yeah. day. And and I have to say, Eden Mills, the setting of Eden Mills, and plus you are literally sitting on people's lawns at their houses, you know, and it was just, it was a beautiful day. The The walk up and down that hill was really, you know, fabulous. And the scenery is just so green and lush there and it, everything yeah. about it. I just can't imagine 
any other book festival rivaling it. And it, that's why yeah. it's the 35th year yeah. this year, right? Okay, well, today... Yes, oh, can I just course. mention one other thing, just because it's kind of cute? I, and and if Shauna listens yeah. to this, that would be... I would love for Shauna to hear this podcast. So when I was walking along uh, to go to the next session, I noticed Ali Hassan was sitting there signing books, and so signing his book. And so I... That he had one person in line who he was talking to and signing her book. And so then I just got in line and then nobody came up right behind yeah. me too quickly, which was good. So as soon as the woman left, I said, I looked at Allie and I just said, hi, Allie, I'm Rebecca. And I started to say Canada reads, you know, and he was right, right away. He was like, are you kidding? I recognize <laughs> your face from Zoom and your voice. And I thought, you know, he's yeah. always been... I think our, the podcast's favorite person ever, because he always says yes, if we want to chat with him. And uh, I told him, I said, well, I left my book of his at home. I said, I didn't know that I would be able to get him to sign it. So I didn't bring it with me. And, but it was just nice to meet him in person. And I agree with you. What a charming, funny, brilliant guy. I just, yeah. So I just had to say that was my moment to meet him after all these years of interviewing him, probably I don't even know, maybe like five or six times or something that we've interviewed him. So he's just super. Such a good day. So what have you been reading lately? <sighs> Not much. <laughs> I had said, I had said at the last podcast, I talked about so many books that I thought, uh oh, the next one will come up and I'll have like nothing to say. And uh, yeah, it's been a, it was a crazy month, I think, but I will talk about my first one, I guess. Yeah. I read... Black Water Sister by Zen Cho, which was one of the ones that our friend Justine had recommended. And I'm going to read just what I wrote on Instagram because I really like what I wrote and I, because I don't like to give away too much and I figure just enough. So post university, Jess, along with her parents, moves to Malaysia, a country she left as a toddler. It is there that she reunites with her estranged maternal grandmother who appears in the form of a vengeful spirit that only Jess can speak to and hear. Through the twists and turns of Ama's revenge plot, Jess encounters Blackwater's sister, a powerful god with an agenda that tests Jess's ability to remain alive and free. And I loved this book. I loved this book a lot because uh, it was... The setting was really different for me. I've never read a book about Malaysia. So while I was reading it, and it really does have a lot of factual stuff about Malaysia in the book, about its, you know, the culture, the the sort of spirit kind of worship or or um, maybe worship's the wrong word. I'm not sure how to say it. But even the physical, the geography of the place was really accurate to the you know to reality and so that was really fun so I learned a lot I loved it I know I'm not supposed to say this but I love Blackwater sister there were times when she was really evil and I was good with that I'm yeah, like I'm su- I'm supporting Blackwater sister I know I'm not supposed to be probably but I loved her so I loved her character now I real I wanted to read it anyways, but now I'm really intrigued when you say that I love her, but I don't think I should support her. Yeah, I think I'm. I think we're not supposed to fully because she, yeah. she's a really, um, a really unique character in that. You know, she has a history too, but she, like I said, she's pretty evil at times. But I was good with it. I was good. I was I was like, yeah. okay, you got to be evil, girl. Be evil. So, yeah. Loved it. Awesome. Uh, so my books tend to are focusing, they're heavy on Eda Mills authors because I was really trying to get some of them in before we went to Eda Mills. So the first book I'm bringing is Pebble and Dove by Amy Jones. And Amy Jones is a local author originally from Nova Scotia, but she now lives in Hamilton. So here's a quick little synopsis of this. So when Lauren receives a text message from her husband, one that she would rather ignore than respond to, she grabs her teenage daughter, Dove, and hightails it to Florida. Now, why Florida? They're going to Florida to clean out the trailer 
of Lauren's late mother from whom she was estranged, and that's Imogen. Mm. While in Florida, Dove, the teenager, stumbles upon a dilapidated aquarium where she befriends Pebble, the manatee. That's all I'm going to say. It's just a lovely family drama, very much about mother-daughter relationships, so that between Lauren and Dove, Lauren and her mother, Imogen, everyone has secrets. Lauren's not telling Imogen something. Imogen's not telling Lauren. Dove Mm. has secrets all over the place and no one is talking to anyone. So there's a lot of miscommunication, but there's a lot of love. It's a colorful cast of characters. There's one character I'm going to shout out, Dr. Carol, who you will love, Rebecca. Oh my God, she's (laughs) such a badass. I mean, she's amazing. She's, anyways, I I loved this book so much. So, highly recommend it if you're in the mood for a family drama with a little bit of humor a lot of heart and a colorful cast of characters am i going next yes you are you're book number two okay book number two is a book that you read and reviewed actually two different times uh the first one was august 16th 2022 because we did like remember we did that one podcast about uh, we had to pair a book, like I think it was fiction and nonfiction, I think. Do you remember oh, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, well, I think that's what, anyway, it was a book pairing one. So it was August 16th, 2022 and October 10th, 2022, which was a regular book chat. Actually, it was book chat number one. Oh. And you talked about Daughters of the Deer by Danielle Daniel. And so I'm actually not going to go into much detail about it because you talked about it and gave a, a lot of description about the story and everything. But I will say this. And I mean this, I don't mean this to be funny, but I mean this sincerely. I think this is a wonderful family sort of historical fiction. It's set in like the late 1600s, I think it is. It's, I think it's a good, really good solid book for non-picky readers. And I mean that sincerely (laughs) because as you, as everybody figured it out by now, I'm kind of picky. And I will just say the thing that was the picky part for me was as I was reading it, I just kept thinking about the role of the two main female characters, which was Marie and then her daughter, who's a two-spirit individual, Jean, and those two women and their lives, I didn't, I just kept feeling so much angst about women's lives historically. And so I I just struggled with that part, but I think it reads really fast. It's engaging. I think the characters are really fascinating. I think she does a good job in creating characters. I still felt like, though, at the end, I didn't really know Marie that well because I'm still not convinced 100% that she wasn't where she really wanted to be, and I'm not convinced that she felt that way towards, you know, as she got older. I'm still not convinced of that. But I do think it's a really wonderful story to read. And one of the things I loved about it is that the author – that is her family genealogy. If you go to the end of the book, the characters' names are the same as the characters in the book. She crafted a fictional story about these people who she is connected to through blood. And I just thought that was really kind of a, a really great and wonderful way for her to imagine their lives and what she knows and maybe what she wanted to create in their lives. So I gave that kudos for that. So, yeah. Excellent. I'm glad you enjoyed it. I so I think I enjoyed it more than you mm-hmm. because I didn't have the picky uh, part. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, no, because I think um, the issues that you have, I totally understand where you're coming from. Mm-hmm. But I think I accepted that as part of the story. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like I, it, it didn't stress me out because I, I. I agree. I don't think Marie was where she, she didn't want to be there in the first place. She was there from a sense in this relationship, from a sense of obligation to her family Mm -hmm. and her, and her tribe. And I don't think in the end, that's not where she wanted to be either, but I, where else would she have been? I don't know. Like, you know, I mean, I think in the, in the time and the circumstances, I don't think there's anywhere else that she could have found herself perhaps. Yeah. And I think that's the part that feels painful to me because I just read about women's lives and I just, I, you know, it's that thing story of how they always say, you know, when people die at such a young age, whether it's, you know, for bad reasons or illness or whatever, 
or, you know, through crime or something like that. We don't know what we lost, right? So for yeah. all the, you know, enslaved people, uh, indigenous peoples that have, you know, died at the hands of, you know, the whole colonial system, you think to yourself, what did the world lose? And I think that way with these women sometimes, mm -hmm. I feel like their lives were supposed to be this. They were supposed to reproduce and raise their children and live and die that way. And they, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, that's what I always think about is what, what did they really want? You know, and I'm not, that part makes me sad. So anyway, that's why, like, like I said, I'm too freaking picky. Most people will probably read that book and really love it and enjoy it. So. <laughs> no, no, and I don't think you're being picky. I, cause it's, you're not having an issue with the writing or even the story. It's just yeah. how the story has affected you. You didn't yes. like. Right. So that's Thank you. nothing wrong with that. <laughs> okay. That's a totally legit response to a book. And maybe it means that the author's doing she's done her job. Yeah. And she has affected you like the story has gotten to you. Right. Yeah. I won't forget this book. So that, you're, that's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. OK, yep. cool. What's your next book? OK, I'm I'm visiting an Eden Mills author yet again. And it's The Berry Pickers by oh, Amanda Peters. Yeah. Oh, my gosh, I love this book so much. Oh, OK. So having said that, that's not what I wanted to say first, but I, so, but I'll start this way. So I originally saw Amanda Peters, I think sometime late spring, early summer, she came to the Burlington library here at my library and talked about the book. I hadn't read it at this point, but from what I knew of the description of the book and the talk that she gave, I knew that unless the book was really poorly written, which it isn't. I knew that I was going to at least enjoy this book, but mm -hmm. I did not expect to love this book oh. as much as I did. I know it was like a journey, like starting the more I read. And by the end of the book, I was just like, I am in this book. Oh, it was so beautiful. So quick little synopsis in case someone doesn't know what it's about. So Joe's family is a Mi'kmaq family from Nova Scotia, and they travel to Maine every summer to pick blueberries. This is actually not something I knew about. I'm from Newfoundland, so from the East Coast as well. But I had no idea that this was a regular thing that Mi'kmaq families in Nova Scotia did on an annual basis. Hmm. So right off the bat, I learned something new. And anyway, so in July 1962, which is the time at the beginning of this book, Joe's little sister, Ruthie, who is four years old, just disappears from the field. And Joe happens to be the last one to see her. Ruthie's disappearance then has repercussions for decades on her family, especially for Joe, who carries the guilt of having been the last one to see her. The book is told in uh, chapters with alternating perspectives between Norma, who is a woman who grows up in Maine single child to a family and Joe Ruthie's brother. I'm not going to say anything else because I think that sets it up enough for you to just kind of go with it. I love the alternating perspectives. Peters examines through her characters, the search for truth and the persistence of love. And it's a beautiful book. Oh, yeah. Loved it. I think everybody I've heard or seen on Instagram that's read it. I don't think anyone's ever had any issues with it at all. No, so no. I'm looking forward to reading it because it sounds amazing. Yeah. So It's a pretty easy one for me to really, it's kind of a cheat of a one to bring here because I'm not introducing <laughs> you to like a new book, but I'm like, I just love this book so much. I'm bringing it. Yeah. So good. Yeah. No, I think, well, why do you, you haven't talked about it before, have you? I no, don't, think, I don't so. think so. I think no. I mentioned in our preview for Eden Mills that she was one of the Mm -hmm. authors that I was looking forward to uh, seeing, but I hadn't read the book at that time. So, Oh, yeah. I didn't realize that. So yeah. this is a recent read. I mean, very yes. recent then. Oh, cool. Yeah. Well, um, that one's on my list for sure. I definitely want yeah. to read that one too. So, and you know, just so that I can, I just want to mention too, uh, I know I'm throwing this in right in the middle, but I want to say this so I don't forget because I know I will forget. When I was uh, hanging out with uh, our friend Colleen she has a really amazing collection in her basement. And mm -hmm. I think I brought home like five books <laughs> from her collection. <laughs> and so I don't think I picked up the berry pickers. I don't oh, think no. I did. 
Oh, I think it's because I felt like I could get that one easily maybe, but anyway. Yeah. So I just want to throw out and say that I will be posting pictures from Eden Mills and also all the books I got from, you know, from Colleen and from the um, purchases I made this past weekend. So yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wanted to say that before I forgot. Yeah. Okay. My last book is called The Brickworks by Lucy E. M. Black. And this is a book that actually, I have an ARC, but it will be released on October 15th. And I also am going to be interviewing Lucy just in a week or two, I think. And so by the end of September, uh, this interview will be out because I want people to know about the book and listen to the interview with Lucy and then maybe go either buy this book or pick this up from your library. But basically, it is a story about two Scottish boys who grow up and end up in the United States and meet in the U.S. working for a steel company, Callahan Steel. And it's set in the, it's really covering the years 1909 to 1910. It's a, it's one year, but then there's all these flashbacks mm. back to like 1879 because in 1879, the Tay Bridge in Scotland collapsed and there were 59 known victims and one of the characters Brody in the story so that's an actual th historical thing that happened but in this is a fictional telling of some related characters but uh Brody the one boy when he is I think 10 when his with his when this uh uh, train collapse or the the tracks collapse over the river and all these people die and his father was like the one who was driving the train so he got the blame for all these deaths so as a kid he was growing up you know being bullied and everything for that happening and eventually he ends up taking his uh, uncle's name I think it is because he doesn't want to be associated with his father's name mm. and so he comes to the U.S. He's well-educated, and he decides he wants to build bridges. So he comes to the U.S. And then there's Alistair, who also comes from Scotland, and he was also working at the same location. And they meet, and they decide to create a brickworks because Alistair's background was he grew up making bricks with his or his father was a brick maker and then his parents his father died blah 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 but anyway so i'm telling this so poorly i apologize you guys but it's really a good story i know i'm all over the place but the bottom line is it's this one year in 1909 when they're both they're they are men they leave the steel company they go out on their own to have this business and it's really the story of this beautiful relationship between these men, because, you know, when you read the dust jacket a little bit, it almost feels like it's going to be just all about bridge building and that whole thing. Yeah. And while there's a very technical detail that she puts into the book about some of these activities like, you know, brick building or brick making and bridge building, it's really about this beautiful relationship between these two men and how important they were to each other. They both grew up you know, not with full families and, and support and love in the way that maybe you want, you know, your children to have. And so they work together. They're so close. They both meet women that are, you know, become important in their lives. And I just thought it was a just a really beautiful, I, I don't think you see male friendships that are this no. really, this compelling, you know what I mean? And that's yeah. what I loved about it. And then the other part that I loved is that she didn't use quotation marks for the for the conversation. It was text was italicized. Oh, cool. So here's what it did for me. It was so weird because it felt it I felt it right away. It felt like I was in the middle of the conversation. Like I was off to the side and you know, peeking around the door and I'm just listening to all the dialogue. Yeah. It just could because you know, once it starts to say like he said, she said, she complained, blah, blah, blah. You know what I mean? That whole yeah. I don't even know what you call that, but when you start, it pulls you out of the discussion because now you're being told this is what they said. But when there's just, it's italicized, it just felt like, oh, I'm like in the middle of the action. Like you're eavesdropping. I know. That's how it felt. I swear. Yeah. That's, it, it's just, it was beautiful. I loved it. I 
just described it so poorly, but I highly recommend this book. My written review will be clearer. <laughs> and I hope everybody picks this up. So anyway, I loved Very it. Cool. Well, I'm looking forward to your interview with her. Yeah, I, I'm really excited because I, I've already had like a million questions running through my head. And some of the things I've just talked about, I do want to ask her about because yeah. I I wonder if they if the author is the one that makes the decision about not putting quotation marks in, for example, like who makes yeah. that decision? I feel like it's it would either be the author because it's stylistic, right? Or maybe yeah. the editor, but I'm thinking mm-hmm. it would be her, like the author. So I can't wait to ask her that. Yeah. So very cool. Okay. My final book is a nonfiction Ooh. and it is called, it's a long title. So okay. let me get ready here. Woman Watching. Louise de Caroline Lawrence and the Songbirds of Pimacy Bay by Marilyn Simons. So I just want to preface this with I have a, I love nature books and nonfiction, and I especially love books about birds. Mm. So I know, I know, I have a weakness for them. I really enjoy them. And this one has a beautiful cover. It's the sketching. Uh, it's a sketch of a cardinal, which is one of my favorite birds, Mm -hmm. sitting on top of a pair of binoculars. It's lovely. And then when you look closely, you actually see, once you start reading the book too, and you get pictures inside that, it's actually Louise de Caroline Caroline is in the um, lenses of the binoculars. So it's a beautiful cover. Anyways, this book, Holy Smokes, I have never heard of this woman. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that because she's become, I realize she's a Canadian icon in the nature and the ornithology world. Ooh. Rebecca, her story is bonkers crazy. So she's originally, she's from Sweden and she was, she's like an aristocrat in Sweden who had wanted more from her life than just being an aristocrat. So she trained to be a nurse. She ended up joining the World War I as a nurse near the end and working in Sweden, but in the POW camps where they kept the Russian soldiers. Wow. She fell in love with one of the Russian soldiers at the end of the Second World War, when he, or First World War, when he was released. He, he had to go back to Russia in the middle of the Bolshevik uprising. Wow. Yes, it's and it's and she followed him. They got married just before he left. So she followed him. The two of them are trapped, essentially trapped in Russia in the winter, trying to escape the oh my gosh, my Russian history, my history in general. Sorry, but let's I'm going to pretend it's just my Russian history is terrible. Um, Same here. Same here. (laughs) I think he was with the Bolsheviks. No, maybe the opposite. I think he is part of the army that is trying to get away from the Bolsheviks. They're chasing them all the, I think they were called the white Russians down. The Bolsheviks were the red Russians chasing them down. They're trying to escape eventually. Anyway, sorry, this is really long, but I'm, I'm got to tell it because it's so bonkers. And this is just in the first 40 pages. Wow. Uh, Yes. He eventually is taken prison by the Bolsheviks and killed. She eventually manages to find her way out of Russia, which takes a while, too. Before he had been taken prison, they had both decided they they wanted to go somewhere where they could truly enjoy nature. And where did they decide they wanted to live? Canada. I was just going to say Canada. (laughs) So she found her way to eventually, uh, well, Quebec, northern Ontario, where she was a nurse in these little like outpost villages where she's the only medical care that these families had. She ended up being the nurse for the Dion quintuplets. Do you know who I am talking about, Rebecca? Yes. I do. Oh my God. She was their nurse. Wow. And she was in the middle of that circus. And after a year, she was like, I can't take this anymore and quit ended up finding building this little cottage in the middle of the woods just further north by North Bay remarried stayed in the woods for almost her entire life she died at 99 the she devoted her life to birds and writing 
And this book is a deep dive into her life. And it is fascinating, beautifully written. It's, um, yeah, I loved it. I devoured it. It was so good. Okay. So did you know about this book or how did you find this book? Because I just think it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, I had heard of this book. So I think it was published mm. in 2022. Okay. I haven't read anything else by the author, Marilyn Simons, but she's uh, written quite a few other fiction and nonfiction books that I'm now going to look into more of her writing. So I had heard of it. And then when I saw it, I happened to be in a bookstore a few months ago and saw it on the shelf. And I was like, and it was discounted. I was like, oh, hello, excellent. bird book, <laughs> you're coming home with me. So I jumped on that. And um, yeah, that's it. And I had no idea what I was in for, but amazing. Yeah. Wow. That is, okay. I think you, of all the books you've talked about, that's just one that I, it's just so 100% not on my radar. I'm kind of thinking, I wonder if it's on a lot of people's radar. So we'll, if anybody has feedback, we'd love to hear it because, uh, wow. I know. And I'm going to end it with a quote from this book because this is on the very last pages. And I love this quote. Um, at this point in the book, oh, and also I, very quickly, I'm going to do a call back to the beginning when you were talking about Eden Mills and the two, two of the books that you really, authors that you were really interested in mm -hmm. and how they had put themselves into their nonfiction books. Mm -hmm. Simons does the same thing because she herself is also a bird watcher and happened to, when she had small children, happened to live just, find herself living just a short distance away from Louise and befriended her. So it's oh, kind of like, oh my gosh. Yes. So it's a very cool thing. So then towards the end of the book, uh, there comes a point when she has just found out that Louise has passed and her cabin has been emptied the books that she so loved that Louise so loved were just left on the side and scavenged uh, this is a quote from Marilyn Simons a person's library is a snapshot of the inside of their mind and that's a picture of Louise that I will never see because she wasn't able to get any of the books before they got taken oh. by other people and I just thought oh that's a great quote it is but that's yeah. terrible Ooh. oh it's uh, the the ending is very I mean she Louise had a an amazing a wonderful life sorry <laughs> sorry go ahead <laughs> I forgot to turn my alarm off <laughs> oh she I don't know if her life was that good but it was no it was she <laughs> um Oh, can't remember. Oh, but uh, the end is sad. The, even though it was such a long life, I still, there was, um, I don't mm -hmm. want to, because I think people should read this book, especially if you're interested in fascinating women. You don't even, there's a lot of bird talk, but if just yeah. you're interested in fascinating women, grab this book. It's beautiful. And I think that might be something like when we celebrate Women's History Month, I think you might want to bring that one back as yeah. a reminder to people because I agree with you. Sometimes women who we who aren't the standard ones that we always talk about as being big historical figures, we need to be reminded of their lives as well. They may not have been as huge as yeah. others, but they're fascinating just the same. Oh, they are. And I will say that for any, uh, all of our Canadian listeners out there, she was also involved in these hinterland who's who uh, videos or ads that used to be on TV, the wow. birds and stuff. I know. I'll send you links so you know what I mean, but it's, they're yeah. iconic little vignettes in uh, Canadian TV history. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think we gave some really good titles today. There may be some surprises for people. I think that one might be a big surprise. I, I love that one. I'm going to have to see if I can. I may have to just borrow that one from you, just perhaps. Borrow, yeah. I don't know if I'd be able to find it. But yeah. uh, but I just want to close with one thing. I, I figure if anybody is listening and gets to the end of this podcast, that means that you are a, you are a good friend of the podcast. So here's what I want to say. I'm not putting it in the show notes. So you might just have to, you know, I'll spell it slowly. But if you are interested, we talked about it last, our last podcast about having like starting in January, maybe doing like a monthly special subscriber type of activity where we would have like a book chat with all of you or anybody who's interested. 
And Tara and I kind of talked about it and we have an idea of how we would like to do it. So if you're interested, please email me and I'm going to give you my personal email account. Again, I'm not going to put it in the show notes, but I figure seriously, if you're at the end of this podcast, you're a good friend. So (laughs) my email address is E, D as in dog, I, N, A, 916 at Gmail. And that's Adina916 at Gmail. And if you email me, I will sell, I will let you know kind of what our plan is for the new year. And if you're interested, great. And if you're not, that's okay too. We don't expect, you know, necessarily, you know, like a ton of uh, response to start with. But if you are interested, we'd love to explain to you exactly what we're thinking and how we want to do it. And uh, yeah, I think that's kind of it. Yeah. Anyways, until next month, well, I was going to say you'll hear from Rebecca sooner. Mm -hmm. And actually, you'll hear from me. Take that out. It's not until the end of next month. (laughs) (laughs) It's whenever. It's whenever, right? (laughs) It's whenever. I know, but I know that spooky season is coming upon us. Yes. So that's a little hint hit for one of our next or upcoming episodes. Until then, happy reading. Thank you for joining us on our bookish journey. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing Canada Reads American Style wherever you listen. You can connect with the podcast and Rebecca on Instagram at Canada Reads American Style and with Tara at On a Branch Reads. Until next time, keep reading. <laughs>